Hey everybody, welcome to another show. So this one is a little different and instead of me interviewing someone or instead of me uh, throwing out a Q&A and, and answering your questions, I'm actually being guest interviewed by a guy who has an absolute stud resume in the field and that is Josh Hinkst. I will say, so Josh, I, I meant to interview him for a long time now, but Josh flipped the script on me and asked if he could interview me on speed and power and, and related training topics for American football. And when I say football, really, no matter what sport you work with, it's this is really applying uh, concepts of, of speed and biomechanics for team sports. So, so American football and team sport and really translating sprint and speed and biomechanic topics really into that environment. Yeah, like I said, Josh has a, a superstar resume. He's the head strength coach of the 2018 Super Bowl champion Philadelphia Eagles. He's had past experience with the Jacksonville Jaguars, the University of Nebraska, the Atlanta Falcons, as well as Florida State University. Josh is multi-talented. Not only is he a strength coach and, ex and a successful one at that, and doing uh, a lot of work particularly with the Eagles and in integration of sports science and really being on the cutting edge there, he also is a sports nutritionist and has done a lot of work in the past in the realms of sports nutrition at some of his previous stops. In 2013, he co-authored the Athlete's Guide to Sports Supplements uh, when he was at the University of Nebraska. I first met Josh back in 2004 in Barcelona, Spain, and it's been phenomenal to be able to stay in touch with him since then. I'm super humbled that he wanted to interview me. This is like a, it was a great opportunity to share my thoughts and put some thoughts together on these topics. But again, just super humbling to be interviewed by a person with such an awesome resume who I've been trying to get as a typical interview guest for this show. So anyways, uh, we'll, we'll get on to it here. Just a couple of quick topics that we are going to run through is sprint, uh, sprint development and sprint mechanic development and speed drills. And particularly uh, as that pertains to team sport, we're going to get into concepts on training the foot, uh, some particular concepts that I've, that have really stuck with, with me from a Darian bar that I've learned from him and how that uh, pertains to sport. We're going to talk about isometrics, hamstring injury prevention, and more. This was a really fun talk and I hope you guys enjoy it. So, so let's get onto it. Episode 210. Guest interviewer Josh Shanks and I having a conversation on speed and power topics. Well, first, I wanted to start off by sharing, you know, just to thank you for, um, you know, it's not often that, you know, people um, like me get a you know chance to thank people like you that, you know, that you're learning from and that you're progressing from. And and I've just appreciated that, you know, it's been a, a really good thing. And I know that there's others in the field like like in my shoes that that want to say that and uh yeah. So I just, I mean, a lot of different thoughts. I mean, you know, I think probably for me, you know, I think, you know, a lot of the questions that you kind of have chewed on and, and some of your interests, it's fun. Cause I think we can all see where your brain's at sometimes based on the, some of the people that you're bringing on the podcast with <laughs> tendon health or, uh, you know, some different things like that, but I think it's all really good, good stuff. But I guess, you know, the first question I had is, is probably one that you've answered a lot. And I think it's just more or less your take on some of the speed mechanics and running drills and those application in team sports. You know, I think a lot of people in my shoe shoes are like, Oh, well, we're not going to change that now. You know, we're getting 23 year old athletes and, you know, are we wasting our time in those types of things or, or how do you feel? What, you know, what uh, do you think that we can make, make change and how much time and energy do we devote to these things? Yeah. So yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I would say just in my time working with team sports in the running situation and thinking about it and watching and observing as well, I think that I'll start with the good actually, because I think that it's in my nature to sometimes be a little contrarian. As I was mentioning a little bit before we started recording, I, I always try to stay balanced and I always try to really fill like both sides of the equation. And so with the, the common sprint drills, the A's, the B's, and whatever else there is, and all the marching type stuff, because I guess if we think of a sprint drill, we, we think of a march. It's you're not going too fast horizontally. You're slowing the horizontal component down, so there's some things mm -hmm. in the vertical plane that uh, you can work on. And so I'll start with the positives, as, as I do think that there's always a bandwidth. I, I mentioned this in speed strength, that, but I think that even if there's a disconnect between the actual mechanics in a marching-based drill, for an athlete who might be a very like muscular type athlete, like they're very muscle driven, they they tend to really squat deep in their movements, which isn't a bad for being a football player and, and, and accelerating. That's that's really important. But for someone who may not be in touch with their feet so much, 
I think it gives a good opportunity to give them exposure for some of the vertical contacts. It's plyometric in some ways. So I, I think mm-hmm. that's okay. I, I I don't have a problem with that. I think it's good. And the Pol uh the Pol or who was it, Gerard Mach or I think he was Polish, when he came up with that stuff, it was really because they couldn't run I, I don't know how many indoor tracks they had and they just had to come up with a creative way to maintain um muscle specific conditioning for sprinters. So if we mm-hmm. think of if I'm a football player or a basketball player and most of my movement is with a lower center of mass and it's a little more specific to having to change directions quickly, uh, which I wouldn't, if I was a football player, I kind of wouldn't want to really run like a sprinter. Cause I, sometimes I think about it, if I'm spending more time in the air by nature, mm. I need to, the time, the, the, the time for me to make a decision is, is more or less. Sorry. Mm. Basically it's going to take, if it takes me longer to put my foot down, now I can't mm. change directions as quickly. And I will say, and I don't want to deviate from the question of sprint drills because I'm going to get there, but me and Adarian Barr have been talking just in a track context about strategies. You watch athletes run the 400, and a lot of these athletes who are dying at the end of the race die because they don't, they can't switch strategies. Like they run one way, whereas Wade Van Niekirk does different things with his arms and legs on the bend. Like he switches strategies. So this being said, I do think it is valuable for a football player or, or team sport athlete to be able to have different strategies, but I wouldn't, I don't think I'd ever watch a football player run and think, man, you need to run as long as you're not running away. It's going to get you hurt. You know, like excessive anterior tilt and the backside mechanics, poor backside mechanics that come with anterior tilt. Like I get that and we want to minimize those, but I don't necessarily need to see you run like Usain Bolt. Uh, okay. So this being said, I think, uh, just general connection with foot strength. that's a little more elastic in nature, which is a good uh, counterpoint to muscular movement. I think it's rhythmic, which I think anytime you can induce rhythm in a warm up is good. I think it's just a good way to warm up and that's fine. Yeah. Uh, and I also do think that if you, the more you understand sprinting and mechanics and timing, you can make those A's and B's a little bit more like running. And so, uh, yeah, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I just certainly, think they can be used well just like the speed you could say the same thing on the speed ladder some ways if you can use it in context and there's like a novelty or a rhythm component yeah you don't move Mm -hmm. like that on the field but it could be a good warm-up uh so then i'll say the cons of of those sprint drills is i have seen athletes who uh, athletes who are more robotic like there's athletes who can do the a's and b's and then go sprint after and there's no negative interference like they they sprint as if they never did that a and b but then there's athletes who are very mechanical minded to begin with. And, and that's where I think you can get a problem. Cause I used to, when I was coaching track, I worked with these athletes who were the drill masters and they were very analytical. And it's like, you could tell they want to do everything quote unquote perfect. Mm-hmm. And then they would run like that and they would get blown, their doors blown off. And granted, these athletes weren't necessarily genetically gifted either, but they get their doors blown off by athletes who just would just run. And what's funny too, is a lot of those athletes who would just run and be fast, naturally kind of tended to be a little air quotes lazy on the sprint drills because i think Mm -hmm. i don't know maybe there was just this looseness or like they didn't in their maybe subconscious they didn't want to they knew there was a a, a mechanical disconnect and so the biggest mechanical disconnect too i'll just say there's a few things one is there's no horizontal velocity and when you're running um i will say like the peak one thing i've been thinking about lately and this is in the weeds but the peak load or when the foot pronates or flattens and it doesn't flatten that much in sprinting because it's fast but that peak Mm -hmm. flattening that's happening when the foot's about right under the hip and in a lot of we we hear people talk about sprinting and we talk as if the foot should strike right under the hip that is not true it needs to strike in front of the hip because otherwise you would fall on your face but what happens is the foot strikes in Mm -hmm. front you load the body the foot reaches kind of its peak uh loading pressure under the hip and then you're on the way out the back um and so in the sprint drills, though, you're really just coming down right under the hip. You, there's no horizontal force, or there's no horizontal speed, sorry. So the whole, like, strike in front of the hip, come out the back, which is an unbalanced nature, is not present. Um, sprint drills are perfectly balanced. And just basically there's no horizontal motion, and so you're always going to have a disconnect there. And so uh, so that is a problem. But, I mean, it doesn't necessarily it doesn't have to be if you just don't. Um, take the drill too seriously mm-hmm. in their guards of trying to make it a connect too much. And by that, I mean giving it an overly positional quality, meaning I think when we say heel up, knee up, toe up, 
I think that can create a situation where I'm just I'm I'm becoming more wary as I be, as I get further in coaching. I just become a little more wary of uh, telling athletes what position they should be in when they run. Not that I don't have like a technical mm-hmm. model in mind because mm-hmm. I do have. It's like you need to be in a bandwidth of these general positions for the most part. If you're not, you might get hurt. You're not going to be as fast as you can be. But mm-hmm. if you give athletes hardline positions, then you're going to start seeing over time. They're just going to go to that position and they lose their ability to sense and feel and move as children learn. And so and that's that's a difficult topic mm-hmm. to fully understand. So I don't want to get too far into it, but I try not to be too positional. And you could just say a different thing to an athlete who has just has it, it, like a tail kicking anterior tilt doesn't get out of anterior tilt. That's the mm-hmm. big thing. Anterior tilt is not bad. It's just if you don't get out of it, it's bad. So that athlete who might be stuck in that position um, in their drills, maybe, maybe rather than saying like, you know, suck your gut in or, you know, the heel up, knee up toe. Maybe I would just say, hey, look, mm-hmm. here's a, here's a rubber band between the bottom of your pelvis and your ribs. And I just want you to think about where that, how that rubber band is tensing and pulling as you're going, like I want to give them a feeling mm-hmm. to work with rather than, and again, I don't want to, I'm going to keep like jumping off into different things that are not sprint drill specific, but mm-hmm. the, I, I just, I'm more wary of, of positional, of pure positional cues. Um, I will say team sport, yeah. the guy who runs the fastest 40 doesn't, it doesn't give you 10 more points automatically. Like, you know, they don't have two guys go out before the mm-hmm. game and say, okay, we're going to race. That'd be funny if they did, right? Like, uh, yeah, and can. seven points for whoever wins. Like, that'd be cool, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, this stuff matters more in in track or swimming than it does, I would say, team sports. The you know that that the hundredths matter a lot more in track and swimming. But we want to give our athletes the best that we can. Uh, so yeah. I'd say it's it can be overly positional. What was I going to say? So it's robotic, mm-hmm. overly positional, no horizontal. Gosh, I had one more in there, but. I don't know. I forgot it. So if I remember it, I'll, I'll come back with it. But those are some main primers that I tend to look at. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You know, it's almost like there's no harm, no foul, especially in the warm up sense. But then, you know, especially uh, in terms of the variation of team sport. Right. And, uh, you know, you, you're talking about different angles and, and positions with the torso and I've really liked some of the the Bosch concepts and, you know, uh, some of the stick type drill work and the medicine ball work, like applying some of those things into like more of the running mechanics drills. And the one with the Bosch concept stuff I really like is some of the upper and lower body separations and, um, you know, working those into some of your drilling in the start, because to your point, you know, there's, there can be, you can lose a lot of intention with your athletes, especially when you start doing some of those mechanics and the, the drills and, um, but you hundred percent, you know, like getting them out. I mean, I, I'm with you in terms of like the, uh, the cueing and the coaching and, you know, it's, it's like, man, if you can hold the med ball and, and, you know, change your, your skip with the med ball in front and maybe that cleans up the pelvis or the torso, like, uh, I'm all for just doing that rather than, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. You, you just don't, I don't know. There's not, doesn't seem like there's as much good return for you. Um, I'm glad, I'm glad you yeah, mentioned that with the med no, ball. That's, that's yeah. good. It's funny because I think Tyreek Hill, actually a lot of people, uh, look at his, uh, mechanics and, uh, you know, he, he's, uh, pretty backside dominant. I think, uh, when you look at him and, and how he runs and, you know, it is, it's a tough thing because obviously we're trying to manage hamstrings and hamstring injuries and, you know, I think that there is probably that it isn't the best when uh, you have some excessive backside and you're, you're seeing that ant- excessive pelvic tilt, like you're saying, and you're not able to get out of it. Um, but it, it definitely um, can be concerning. Um, but yeah, no, that's, uh, that's good stuff. Do you have any other thoughts or uh, in terms of like, you know, getting beyond like even some of the, the basic mock drill type stuff, like other things that you think are, um, are really good that uh, team sport athletes should maybe consider. Yeah. I, I, well, I was going to say, I was sorry to interrupt, but I was so glad that you brought up the medicine ball and holding that in front and just using constraints. Cause I, 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 I just speak on what's on, like you said uh, before, like you can tell, uh, I don't know if it was a recording or before the conversation, but you can tell where my mind is by the guests that I have. And I've really been on a thing of just motor learning and how do we coach and like Nick Winkleman stuff, the language of coaching. I've been so, I've been very much on that, but also almost maybe so much in my own mind there that 
yeah, just throw a med, just have them hold a med ball. Just have them do something that does it for you. And it, it, mm-hmm. I just, I think that's good stuff. I think that, uh, so where I'm, where I really have gone and what I really like, uh, I remember it going back to my time at Wisconsin lacrosse. Uh, so when I got out of college, uh, it was a few years after we first met, uh, in Barcelona, I went to mm-hmm. uh, yeah Wisconsin lacrosse for grad school. And I went there largely because their track team had such a rich tradition and they dominated in division three for years. And one of the warmups that I, they did commonly that I, I've really uh, kept with me was called a, just, I just called the Seagrave warmup. I guess it was Lauren Seagrave that came up with it. And it was just, you would just do a, a body weight movement, like a squat or a lunge or a lateral lunge or a lying scorpion or something. And then you do a run out like an acceleration. Mm. And I, I really like that stuff because mm. I like things that, uh, well, this the more I can get it, I just did a podcast that was released with Edward Yu, and he's a Feldenkrais guy, and he was just talking about when we get on the ground, we can slow things down and sense ourselves more. And so I do like uh, the interaction between being on the ground and then getting up and running. And like whether you do it consciously or subconsciously, just kind of taking that skill with you and mm-hmm. seeing, notice how it changed your run. I, I've really gotten into that as I'll do. Uh, I'll do a variety of movements and I just try to notice if it made my run, my run out feel better or worse. And that skill of the noticing and, and working with a different movement, I find to be really valuable. Um, and I still, I do still prescribe some sprint drills occasionally in my, in my warmups. I wouldn't say it's just not a cornerstone. Like I don't make it like this cornerstone that's coached. I think it's easy to say, here's like three drills and we really coach these up. And like you said, you're integrating like the boss stuff and the, the, like, imagine like the one where they're. Like you can't, this is audio only, but like your, your torso is twisted to the side and you're trying to run and move with a, a twisted torso yeah. position. And I think that stuff is awesome. And so I, I will yeah. say, I really enjoyed doing like just those, I just, yeah, that Seagrave warm up type mentality and exploring that. And then I, I really, I really like doing squatty run type work, but I will say, I think that team sport athletes, especially football players who are already really good in squatted positions, you know, I don't know if they, I mean, they, they might be, uh, get benefit from that, but if you run like that anyways, I like that for track athletes. To me, that squatty run has largely been a remedy for the track athlete that runs, that's always been told to run tall. And because of that, their foot isn't striking in the right place and they just can't, they can't fold up as well. However, I do think that could be, uh, if we talk about front side and backside balance, like just being able to be in a squatted position and fold up well does give a little bit of front side in a squatted position in a unique way. So I do think there's always value there. I just, I, I'm really into folded up positions and the timing that mm-hmm. comes in and folding up in a good posture too, and the chest forward. And so that's something that I've, I've been enjoying more and exploring as well. Yeah, no, that's great. Coach us through real quick, like a squatty run. Like, I think that that's a, a drill that people that maybe aren't familiar with your podcast would, you know, no, or for me, I wouldn't you know know how to integrate it or coach it up as much. Yeah, it's a it's a super contrarian movement, <laughs> uh, and I, I learned it. It was one of those things where I I've been working with Adarian Barr, uh, my mentor in track and field and human movement for four. Oh shoot, maybe it's almost five years now. And Adarian is very he's he's funny because he's like basically whatever your track coach told you to do, do the opposite. If they said run tall, run low. Like if they said do your arms ninety ninety, mm-hmm. don't do that. Like. I think it's it's kind of it's 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 really funny when you look mm-hmm. at it and and I've been involved in club track for a long time so I see these kids I always see kids getting coached with these drills and I I see it's almost like it's kind of a tragedy because you see a lot of cases purity of human movement and then you see positions getting coached in and the kids are like it's like they're conflicting between the way their body wants to move and what some coach is telling them to do and uh, anyways um mm-hmm. so the squatty run and when I first saw Darian do the video of it, I was like, there was something about it. That I'm like, you know what? I think there's something that's really to this. And I couldn't, I'd never done it. Uh, but then the next day I saw him it for uh, you know, a little practice on Sunday, he took me through it. And within, I'll just give a content, within like a month, I had dropped my own 30 meter time. And I was like 34, I think at the time here, maybe 33, 34, I dropped my 30 meter like point two almost by doing this and again i was the run tall guy i'm the elastic guy who was already elastic and already running tall and then told to run taller <laughs> so i needed to get into the ground more and all the and so and i i also i even use it to break break a 10 yard 10 meter fly by point six hundredths which is crazy um so anyways and that's just through me just running a little lower so 
all it is is just running with lower hips. So let's say I'm standing there. Instead of trying to run tall, I'm going to run and I'm going to pull my hips down maybe six inches towards the ground more than normal. There's a bandwidth. You can do any kind of up or down. And so in that position, I, I'm generally going to want to keep my chest forward. Like whatever I would be in upright running for the most part, I want to be in that position. And from there, I'm essentially running in just a maybe a six to eight inch squatted position. Mm -hmm. And the key is that uh, your elbows behind you, so let's say the same side, so like my right side elbow behind me, it's going to time up with my right knee coming forward. And mm -hmm. I've noticed athletes who are really good accelerators naturally when I bust out the 10 yard dash, I can just give them like a one minute demo and they're pretty good at it. Like their timing in a squatted position is good. Athletes who are really bad at the 10 will get down there and they have no idea what to do <laughs> because they're just not good at moving with a low center of mass. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's, yeah, you're, you're running forward and now you can run fast or slow. I, I, I think of it about maybe 75% of your typical max speed. Mm -hmm. it, it can really, it can be a lot of things, but about, let's just say 75% and you're using your, making sure your arms and legs are timing up well because it ref, uh, represents the mid stance of gait. You're generally mm -hmm. going to actually hit with a flatter foot. Now where this fits the top end is it doesn't fit from the foot, the, the knee down because when you're actually running, you're going to hit with more of a supinated foot. So a, like a pinky toe side, a little bit of plantar flexion, the way the body spirals. Mm -hmm. So you kind of taken that part out. But from the knee up, it's pretty much like upright sprinting. And you can really work out kinks in posture and timing mechanics. And it can actually help clean up. Uh, like if you have someone who's unhealthily backside dominant, it could help clean up their position without having to necessarily force it's like a constraint. It's it will keep help them to do that without necessarily forcing it. And so yeah, there's a lot of benefits to it. Darren even would make us do it as a finisher. He'd make us do a squatty run at 400 as a finisher, and that's like the ultimate uh, natural glute burn. You know, not manufactured like I guess you could say squatting might be. It is like a natural ultimate glute burn. Um, yeah. My body responded well to that. So that's the gist of it. I, I've yeah, I've seen some really good things with it. I wanted to take a quick break from the show to share with you a little bit about what our sponsor, simplyfaster.com, now has available in their store. You hear me mention in the outro of the show all the time about the free lap timing system in the K-Box, which I have and use regularly. But today I wanted to share a little bit more about the bar speed monitoring units that Simply Faster has, which is the Gym Aware and the new portable flex unit. So let me start with the gym wear. I mention it regularly on the show. It's been referred to as the Cadillac of bar speed monitors. Carl Valley calls it a lab inside a lunchbox as the readings you get out of the gym wear go well beyond typical concentric or just up the up phase of the lift velocities. Rather, you can measure the entire shape of the barbell lift in terms of eccentric velocity, range of motion, and total work done. Total work being awesome, by the way, especially like comparing a long-armed bench presser or a 610 squatter versus a 511 point guard. So you're getting all these extra metrics that you're not getting on other units. It's perfect for teams wanting to manage the weight room and the data synchronizes to software platforms such as Coach Me Plus, Team Builder, and Athlete Monitoring. So new to the store is the Flex, which is the ultra portable and lower price travel version of the coach's favorite gym wear. So just like the gym wear, the Flex measures the shape of each rep, range of motion, total work done, eccentric dynamics, so for this and the gym aware, this is the advantage that a force plate would have over just knowing how high you jumped. You're getting many other metrics and information that go into this unit of work. Compared to similar portable bar speed monitors, this unit gets the entire rep rather than a fraction. So you have here two awesome tools. And if you're interested in upping your game in the velocity-based training and bar speed world, I would definitely recommend heading to the store at simplyfaster.com and checking into these two units. All right, let's get back to the show. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit more about uh, Darian. I know, um, you know, I I pretty much was exposed to Darian through you um, and just knowing you. And I know he's had just such a tremendous impact on your thought. And, um, you know, I've checked out his website, The Bear Running, and really excited about learning more of his thought. But I guess if I'm a guy that's not real familiar with him, um, and you're trying to think of, you know, maybe the a top two or three things you've learned from him and how you would apply that to team sport. Um, what, what things probably jump out at you? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the thing with Adarian is he is the most, like, intuitive, uh, like, sensory 
person I've ever met in the sense of he can watch an athlete move and sees 10 things that I had no idea. And his ability to just, to really just, um, pick out little points of movement and expose you to how an athlete is actually moving that do differ from the norm. Because I think the norm is often a lot of generalizations, um, based off of maybe just, a, a like a force plate in the vertical realm, you know, things that people took data and they were trying to extrapolate it and trying to make connections in more of a linear manner. Uh, and you could talk about like linear versus complex again. Adarian is a very just it's a very like holistic system, and he sees things how things work together. And so, uh, I've 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 really had a great. It's been great for me to learn from him in that way. And when I started writing uh, my book Speed Strength, actually I was I was writing the the sprint chapter and sprint mechanics. And I mean I was a track coach, but I still didn't feel like I was a a master of sprint mechanics. And if I wanted to write the book, I'm like, well, I got to learn as much about sprint mechanics as I can. And I, I literally bought every book out there on sprint mechanics. And I, I took notes on every, like I took notes on, I think the vast majority of Franz Bosch's gigantic running book, <laughs> that book running that he wrote with Klomp. And, and I mean, and all the books like that, I, I devoured that stuff. Cause I can't, I can't do a book without like doing everything from every side. And I just, Darren was close. And so I, mm-hmm. I, uh, I was able to work with him. And honestly, after, before I met him, I like, I ended up rewriting that whole first chapter and, and it would be stuff that he would be telling me these concepts. I wouldn't understand it at first completely. And then it'd be like, I'd just sit on it and it'd be like, I'd just be in the shower. I'd be like, Oh, that's it. Like, it's like that Eureka moment and that I have to go write it down in Evernote and then I'm going to put in the book. And so working with him is just really, I've had a ton of illuminating stuff, but yeah. So I'll start with the feet. Um, some of the biggest things that a daring watches and I'll just like is foot steering. So watching athletes and being in team sport, this is a good one, is, and, and you can't see this, and so I'm going to use my hands visually so to help direct my speech as best I can. But watch if an athlete, let's say you're doing a curvilinear run, like I think we're all familiar with curvilinear mm-hmm. running, and, and or in track, running a curve on the track, but to watch the athlete who is able to, before the foot comes down, steer the foot slightly in the direction they're going to turn versus the athlete whose foot comes down kind of straight and then the heel slides hard as the result so basically and, and i'm a high jumper and a darian coaches high jump you see the same thing in high jump running the curve is the athlete who can really kind of match the curve with the preemptive steering of their foot so that foot turns in anticipation of ground strike versus an athlete mm. whose foot just kind of comes down and then that heel spins hard in the middle and so if you're just if you're doing like a pro agility drill, I mean again, non specific from a decision making perspective, but you can see the stuff show up from a general movement perspective. It's just having an awareness of can you turn your feet? And then uh, you can take that into the raw raw materials section and I'll just have people like I was working out with the uh, basketball strength coach at Cal uh, before he left, we would work out together and run on the track a lot. And I noticed that his running style was very much uh, like very much a lot of external rotation, the femurs as a lot of fast athletes are because they're getting a lot out of their glutes, but his feet had very little um, like turn. If I would have told him to hold his heels, like fix your heel bones, fix your calcaneus, now uh, turn your feet left and right with the heel bone fixed, he had almost zero movement. And so mm. there is like a move, you do have to have a little bit of, of raw movement, raw steering available to just be subtly a little better from that that standpoint and so that's one of those little nuances that i would have had literally zero idea literally zero <laughs> and so you see that show up in a lot of things you see it show up in a tennis serve just these little subtle things where athletes have to steer their body steer their direction and one thing he says is millimeters adarian is millimeters create waves so a, a very small thing that happened in the body and like the foot does become a wave uh, up the chain and so that was that was a real big one for me. Uh, another one is Achilles tendon stuff, like a lot, and this being maybe more of a basketball, but I know it certainly happens in football too. But um, Adarian's really good at looking at, like a lot of times, I think when we just look at Achilles from a pure data and workload perspective, it can get bewildering because it is some you know some athletes who have good foot mechanics and who's a good movement mechanics, they can do huge workloads and not tear anything. But athletes who have a poor mechanic could have a problem and. Adarian would show a lot. It was Kobe Bryant um, doing a, that split step who, towards Achilles doing his famous like split step move where he would mm-hmm. drop down. He'd be dribbling. He would drop down and his legs would kind of split to go. 
but his back foot, the heel would always hit the floor. So he's getting a huge stretch load on the Achilles every, and who knows how many thousands or tens of thousands of times he's done that in his life. And so another thing with the foot, if we're looking for team sports and Achilles would be the foot, is the foot working as a first class lever or a second? Uh, a second meaning that that athlete can get the heel off the ground early in movement rather than the heel staying glued. And they can get up to the ball of the foot of the transverse arch being the fulcrum point. So the, 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 the whole foot can lever over that efficiently and that preserves Achilles length. The Achilles doesn't get overstretched. And so just watching, um, so you're watching athletes foot steering, you're watching athletes tendency in a first or second class lever situation would be a good one. And I think too, yeah, I, I also just like seeing how, uh, I could also say inside edge, but I, I'll, I'll say I want to get into the upper connection. And then I just think, yeah, can athletes run folded? How well do they run folded and squatted? Because uh, you see a lot of things in there. You see, um, like I'll have tennis players who just cannot move laterally on the court to save their life. Uh, and the coach will say, oh, well, this guy is great linear, but he's really bad laterally. And, you know, put him in a squatted position and put a physio ball in front of him. And, and so they have good postures holding like a big physio ball and like they can roll it. Mm-hmm. And, and what's your lateral movement look like squatted or just general multilateral movement look like squatted? And you can really start to pinpoint things that might be showing up, internal rotation deficits, um, stuff that's happening at the foot, or maybe it's, maybe it's even rib rotation. And so once you get that athlete in that squatted position with a good vertical posture, a lot of these movement things can really come to light. And so those are three that I think are have really, if I'm watching athletes move in team sport, I will say too, I do watch like the inside edge of the foot versus outside edge a lot because in the weight room, you watch athletes and the ones, there might be an athlete who's a good squatter, but then you watch them walking around, they're just really supinated on the outside of their feet. And it's like, well, this is why you're six, seven and can only touch like 10, six, you know, <laughs> even though you've been squatting, you know, a squat and doesn't matter because you're not putting the force where you need to. And so just, yeah, just being aware of where the force is on the inside and outside of the foot and those transfer tendencies and the way that that circle of force is transferring. Those have been some big elements for me. I mean, that's a perfect lead in actually to my next question. So I know that the foot is an area of passion for you. And uh, I believe that you might be working on an, another book related to the foot and training the foot um, and of which I'm pretty excited about. Um, I guess leading into that, like talk me through some of the um, – you know, so great, you know, we can visualize some of these different ways that athletes feet interact with the ground and what makes them a little bit better movers relative to that, you know, um, with the foot, but how do we, you know, okay, let's say a guy is good in the first and second class levers, but how do we train some of those things or are those just natural, um, things that, um, you know, the athlete has, what, what are your thoughts on, and you can expand beyond, you know, what you shared about Adarian's thought and just in, even into, you know, in team sport, like, what do you think are some of the, you know, man, these are some core staple parts of training the foot that every team sport athlete should be doing. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, it's a big one too. And so, yeah, my, I'm writing a book and I'm hoping to have it done soon. It's called best foot forward. It took me a little while to figure out the name, but I think it'll be solid. And so, yeah, the, one of the big things that um, I've really I've talked to a Darian about is every, well, first off, the foot is insanely complex to the point where, and I was just talking with Corey Schlesinger about this, the point where the talus bone can be aligned and have facets that are very individualized, and there's no real like to to say your foot should be this optimal alignment or that optimal alignment. We have a lot of individual differences there, and. Another interesting thing is if we look at all the research-based stuff and all the clinical stuff on the foot, it all revolves around the foot and walking. But the thing is that that is pretty different than the foot in running and jumping. And that's something I've really dug into heavily is, is I, I, again, where, where, I, where I started and where I finished when I read all this, you, you start and you're looking at all the walk-based stuff. And, and then and I've talked with David Gray on this as athletes. He's seen, he's seen it too where people can look like crap in a single leg stance and walking, but then they can kind of get it together when they run. <laughs> I'm not mm-hmm. saying that's the optimal situation that, that might lead you to get injured. But uh, one thing Adarian was recently telling me, and we were talking about this last time we were at the track, is when, in gait or just walking, you're kind of working with whatever you have in the foot, the way your bones move in, in the foot and flex and how functional your foot is. You're kind of working with how functional your foot is. But as soon as you start running, it's more about managing the foot and managing ground reaction forces. 
And you can actually work around kind of not having the most optimal foot in some ways. Now, again, I'm not saying you might get hurt at some point, <laughs> mm. but you can, you can manage a foot in fast, explosive movement. And then I think that would look at more like looking at injury and things like that we're looking at. So let me talk about uh, the foot explosively first in terms of just, just raw performance. And so there's a few things that I really like that I tend to do. Um, one of the main things as I had Chong Jian, he's talking about you know, hyper arch foot and, and kind of those curled toes that are show up in just really good movers. And that it's not just the toe. It's you have to have metatarsal head pressure for that to work. Basically the balls of your feet have to be in a good connection with the ground to get that like good claw action. If you have poor ball, of the foot pressure, you get more of like a hammer toe or like a kink in your toes or grippy toes. And that's not good. So what we want to see ideally really is some level of, of um, the tendons on the top of the foot popping out. We want to see some, some curl in the toes, but that then we don't want gripping toes. We don't want grippy toes and we want to see good met head pressure. And so when we have these things, usually a better movers, better jumpers, better sprinters, just better movers on land have that. And, and the biggest thing that we see here is reactivity. We see RSI, we see that quick explosiveness. And so to that end, and Chong has the hyper arch hop that he's um, an exercise he likes. But essentially, I think that just any hopping, preferably barefoot and preferably on different sensory surfaces, I think is good um, with metatarsal head pressure and not over gripping the toes it, and doing that high rep is a good thing. Uh, it was funny. Uh, Chong wanted people to do it for five minutes, that hop. I was just talking with Max Shank about um, how the heart, a recent podcast, how the heart is like our, or the foot is like our second heart because there's a lot of veins and venous return that go through the foot. So mm -hmm. I like the idea of just doing some sort of foot based thing for five minutes right off the bat. So hopping is easy. If you have athletes that don't mind doing the same thing, they could just hop back and forth for five minutes. But Max had said, well, you could dance for five minutes. You could hip hop dance for five minutes and make it very foot mm -hmm. you know, oriented. I mean, I've been in all the hip hop, like, att my attempts to learn hip hop dance, I always felt like my foot feet were always very awakened and activated and that kind of thing. So just something along those lines for a, a longer time, I think is a good thing. I'm a really big fan of PVC pipes, um, which Probot X and Marv Marinovich, uh, really big fan of that stuff. I've actually found that that type of work can restore pressure to parts of the feet that aren't getting it. Uh, I actually found that out through my wife uh, having her. She does morning workouts sometimes, and you know, I, she has a feet that her calcaneus, her heel bones, ever it a little bit, and she has high arches and kind of poor fifth met head pressure and these things. And so we found that just doing PVC pipe work, where you're standing on two four inch diameter PVC pipes and doing various things, um, mm -hmm. she there was one of those movements that she found after she got off. She's like, "Wow, I feel like all my feet, more of my feet are on the floor now," like which is awesome. You know, that's, that's going to help mm -hmm. you get a better upstream channel, prevent injuries. The more of your, you know, the, obviously you need that fifth met head, that fifth ball, ball, the pinky toe met head on the ground, um, mm -hmm. to have that tripod. And so, uh, PVC pipes are big. And now I will say this, there is a genetic component to the PVC pipe because I, I was, and I've just seen this more, like I was talking with, uh, well, there is a genetic and then there's a manufactured. If you're in orthotics, I guarantee you're going to suck at PVC pipes, hands down. You will suck at it because the orthotics are going to kill sensation in your feet. But I also have found that generally speaking, uh, Ross Jeffs on a recent podcast was talking about uh, elastic athletes tend to have a better sensory and proprioceptive relationship with their feet and posterior chain than more muscle driven athletes. And I just think, and there is a lot of developmental stuff in there. And so I think that not to say a muscle driven, maybe quad driven, more squat type athlete couldn't develop a good relationship with their feet because they can get better. But I think that mm -hmm. it's those athletes who are like those bouncy elastic. I think they just have nervous system connections that they had from young childhood and up, you know, and they're just going to have a little bit of an advantage there. And that's their bread and butter, you know. So uh, that stuff is really good. And then things on different surfaces and slanted surfaces and convex and concave surfaces, the Polish people, you know, the Polish coaches and the Russians, they knew what they were doing with that stuff. When I was coaching at Wilmington, I had a slant board my dad made for me that was made out of wood that was real nice. And just always having an athletes do things that force their feet to steer onto that laterally and just get creative. I, mean, I would see Marv Marinovich have, have two slant boards and he'd have, uh, or maybe it was Gary, his brother, I, I forget whose video, but they would have them 
uh, it was like a 30 degree slant and they, they would hop around that board like almost in a 360 or something on their foot and then hop to the other and do a 360 and just being creative with a variety of surfaces and angles uh, is really important. And so from the performance end, those are some things that I really enjoy. And of course, you know, all this is and a ton more is going to be the book I have to self promote, right? Uh, and then the, from the injury perspective, it's can your joints move and do you have, is there anywhere where you're missing pressure in your foot? Uh, the biggest wholesale thing, uh, I think I've talked about this a little bit before, maybe it was the last q and I forget, is uh, to me, one of the biggest things is can your heel bone, can your calcaneus move? Um, can it uh, plantar flex or tip forward anterior tilt? Uh, imagine your, your, um, your hip bones anterior tilting, your calcaneus bone, your heel bone does the same thing, it tips forward. And then can it evert? Uh, and there's a bandwidth, there can be too much eversion, but if it's not everting at all, you're probably going to have some Achilles issues. So, uh, Gary, you can get a little bit of that through the PVC pipe. I've also, uh, Gary Ward's work, what he's doing with his wedges is unbelievable for that stuff. And so I think when it comes to a healthy foot that's resilient to injury and able to move and the joints can move, uh, Gary's stuff is top notch. I know he has an online course out now and that I'm going through. So just getting from a, a injury prevention, can the joints move? And then the, I think the biomechanics on the field as well, like I was talking about with uh, Darian stuff. Yeah, no, that was great. Just kind of a follow up on on the joints moving in the foot because I do think that that's you know really got some important applications, especially kind of mobilizing that you know before activity and guys getting on the field. Do you feel like you mentioned um, David's um, you know uh, wedges and things like that? Do you think that's kind of the best tool that you would see in terms of maybe just trying to mobilize the foot before activity? Yeah, so. I think that uh, Gary's wedges are like a surgical tool. And yeah, it was David Gray who actually who was showing me a lot of that stuff initially as well. Because uh, he had said, David told me, he's like, yeah, I got rid of my Achilles by basically doing like a thousand, what do you tell me? He's like, I basically did a thousand anterior tilts of my calcaneus in a day. And then the next day I never had problems. And I found something almost very similar, to be honest. I just needed to get that thing to move. And I've seen I've seen people go through actually Achilles rehab programs without getting much progress at all. And then all of a sudden they get their calcaneus to move and then they're jogging the next week. Like it's, it is big time. Um, so I will say that method is a little more surgical in nature on some level. Like everyone's going to have a little bit, maybe different nuance to what, and, and I haven't gone through, you know, all that entirely yet. And that's on my checklist is to get through Gary Ward's, uh, course, and then hopefully get through his in-person courses and those types of things. Uh, but I will say that, um, if you can get the calcaneus to move, and then you do just like a lot of like the Marvin Marinovich style stuff is within the PVC pipes, especially once you get into like the, the oblique angle stuff. Um, he also had uh, like these circular discs that had a little, it almost reminded me of those jump soles with the little proprioceptor plug, which I think he also had a hand in. But just stuff mm-hmm. that allows the foot to rotate and ankle to rotate circularly on its axis is really good. Um, and then David, uh, Dave, this is one of David's things. Actually, he'll mention this in a podcast we have. But I, I think he calls it the foot suspension. And I've actually used something like this to help a higher arched individual put two inches on their vertical in like 15 minutes where basically you just put a sock or something or a wedge in the arch of your foot and you're just trying to squat down and feel the arch um, just drop a little bit. You're just trying to feel the, that arch drop. And so, so there's a lot of people whose foot is super rigid and have no drop. And again, when they're sprinting, you, you can work around it. Your foot might spin a little bit. Um, you can still, but a lot of that is the injury element of it all. And, and there are some, I will say there are some performance, um, performance grade things with the foot and sprinting too. It's not all management. There are some steering things and nuances, uh, that I've learned too, but, uh, the, yeah, I would say that those are some, some things the the, the biggest ones, if it's a big group and you can't, you know, wedge everyone up, so to speak, I, I like the, I like the Marvin Marinovich stuff a lot. Yeah. And then, you know, you mentioned orthotics just a little bit. I mean, that's, we see that a lot, right? Our professional athletes, uh, you know, you know, everybody wants a uh, custom orthotic or, or whatnot. What, what's your take on just advising an athlete uh, from that perspective? Yeah, man. I mean, it's tough because it's, you know, in a high performance environment, you're going to have, you're going to have different silos and there's always, there may be a sports medicine person or a doctor that's just like, look, like they have orthotics and that's just how it is. And as soon as like, I'm trying to say, don't wear, you know, like that's, it, it's tough because you're a different, but I will say there's better orthotics that are coming out. And I know Gary, I forget if it was on a show or if just offline, but 
Gary was starting to talk about some really minimalist orthotics, like stuff that's just really sensory driven orthotics. And I think we can just, all we can do in some ways yeah. is just hope that stuff gets pushed faster. Uh, I should actually reach out to Gary on who's making that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I don't know if it's the people who did smart mm-hmm. feet or not, but so, I mean, that's one thing is we just have to uh, aim towards those those more minimal things and i mean we do also have to be realistic and i know that there are people who are in pain and they were orthotics and then they can move and manage it right so it's it's always going to be a balance like yeah. yeah it's funny like my wife actually um you know she's had some uh foot issues you know she was a heptathlete and whatnot but um and i remember taking one of the postural respiration restoration courses and uh you know, she's always worn a a foot orthotic and it was amazing how her joints, like all of a sudden just boom, 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 everything lined up. Um, and you could tell that everything was tracking the way it needed to be as soon as you, you know, gave her that, that foot, that feedback. Um, but then I think it is a fine balance, you know, it's it's probably kind of one of those things. It's just depends a little bit on, on that athlete and the person and, um, so there is certainly, you know, maybe a place there, but I, yeah, it's, it's, uh, an interesting area. It's uh, encouraging to know that there's, you know, some advances on, on some more minimalist, more kind of sensory driven, uh, uh, makes sense to me. The uh, last thing I was just going to say with that too, is I, I do think like there is with those, since those athletes do do so much better, I think it's almost just trying to find times for them to not be in them and find having a specific goal for that and maybe just wear it less. And eventually if, you can get out of it then cool like yeah. but there's always it's just like minimal shoes too i it's easy to say oh minimal shoes are the greatest like they're everyone should be in minimal, minimal shoes all the time and but in reality like we walk on flat artificial surfaces so that's not normal you know if all we did was walk on grass and twigs and you know that then it probably would be okay to be in the minimal shoe for everyone um, and again, I do think that would be the goal on some level but more people if you look at the research more people actually get hurt in minimal shoe running programs. And again, it's of the essence. I mean, you get a good coach in there, there's going to be less, but it, it, without like good, if you just throw the shoes at people and say, okay, go run in these versus running the normal shoes, more people do actually get hurt in minimal. Uh, I, again, it's just, if your arches don't work and your feet don't work well, then this is going to happen to you. Uh, so a- anyways, I do think we, we, we are always so quick to say, you know, barefoot and natural is everyone should just do this, but there's a skill to getting people to that point safely um and you know not staying in orthotics forever and not being in the traditional shoes for all situations forever and things like that no that's that's great um kind of moving changing gears a little bit i guess um you know i love all the the isometric stuff right um i know the the extreme isos and you're a fan of those and um some of the oscillatory stuff uh, i guess i'm kind of curious on your thoughts um uh, yeah, like in, in terms of incorporating the isometrics in your training, you know, um, is that something that you, um, would put, you know, almost, do you feel like that's a, a must have in every type of deal, uh, athlete program? Um, do you like some of the oscillatory stuff? Do you feel like that's a little bit more per- performance driven? I like all the tendon health stuff. And I know, you know, personally, the isometric stuff has been, a game changer, Dr. Jill Cook, she kind of does more like some 45 second protocols. And then, you know, you've had uh, Alex and Tara on your show and his maybe are a little bit shorter, you know, five second holds. Kind of give me your take on, okay, isometrics. Th- these are my, my, this is what I've seen in, in practice. Um, this is really where I feel, you know, they need to be incorporated kind of as a core part of the program, this would be more like the performance side of it. Yeah. Isometrics, man. That's been, that's been a huge part of just my thought process the last five years. Uh, so I'll start with the, maybe the, the, gen, the most general and applicable to everybody, which would be the extreme ISOs. Um, gosh, I'm trying to remember. I, I remember it being a thing like 10 years ago and listening and trying to understand why in the world I'd want to do something for three, four or five minutes straight. If, you know, I'm a power athlete. And so I, I think what fi- I, I'm not, I don't even, I don't even really remember a hundred percent. What was the thing to finally get me on board with trying it? It might've been, I, maybe it was uh, my time with Dr. Tommy John. I'm kind of drawing a blank. I think it was sometime before then, but I, I started really going in on it 
about maybe three years ago. Um, and I noticed, I think one of the first things I noticed, the extreme isometrics being, and it's actually isometric is a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, it's, it's really an extreme slow because you're not bracing. You're actually sinking into it slowly throughout. And, and maybe a little bit of that's tendon creep, you know, Dr. Barr. Um, but it's not a brace. You are, you are pulling yourself for the whole time. And so that's, that's an important element. But I remember I was, I finally got on board with it. And so I did, I made myself a little workout and it was something like, uh, like two days a week, I did one by 20, uh, lifting and then extreme ISOs for three minutes of position. Uh, just total time. I just took breaks. Uh, I didn't go the whole time. Even I just really tried to pull myself into position. And when I was tired, I took a break. And then the other day was extreme slows, which are similar to the ISOs, but you just kind of like, if I'm doing an RFE split squat from the top to the bottom, maybe I take 80 seconds to get there. And then I drop the weight and I Mm -hmm. don't come back up or I come up without the weight. And I don't remember what I was doing the other two days. Maybe I did three days. I should have written this down because I've been, it was after two weeks of not even really doing true plyos or speed. My vertical had gone up like three inches and I was just like, felt like a new man, like jumping off the ground. And this was like age 33, 34. And I was like, man, there's something, something happened here. I don't know what, but it was good. And uh, what I've found is isom- extreme isometrics in, to me, just the, the baseline package of what they do really well is I think they're very good at restoring functional balance to the body. I think they can put the muscles in maybe a little, I know muscle length only changes 10%, but I think a more lengthened state than a contracted state. And I think neurologically they're good because the theory is that the muscles are actually not, they're not contracting, they're actually contracting, relaxing extremely quickly to control the joint in space in that isometric or slightly lowering position. So you're actually getting a very fast um, modality if you really look under the hood. So there's perhaps a recovery and then a coordination element, if you will, because if you say that they're really that fast, then they're stabilizing the joint, there's coordination and so, and there also, there's a small work capacity element. Bottom line is I know that isometrics help you feel better and move better a hundred percent. So that's one thing. And then two, I, they do offer based on how long you do them, they can offer you some good strength elements. I know that when I've used them a lot of times with my teams, I really like using them in a circuit. So if we're doing a work capacity circuit for the first few weeks, um, I like putting them in there. Part of it too, is cause I feel like they're safer if I'm trying to work hard, I would rather have someone work hard in an ISO than doing, you know, a hundred pushups or something. I just feel like from a work capacity protocol and volumes, we can do a lot of work and work really hard. And it's very safe from that perspective. And I've seen athletes in the midst of that work capacity inc- basically hit their highest bench press of the whole year, <laughs> that along with some one by 20. And then when we kind of got more into a main line and granted that, you know, eight hours versus 20 hour training period it makes a difference, but I felt like we were really strong when we were doing that stuff anecdotally. Um, but I do know too, they are mentally taxing athletes get bored of them. There's a lot of like, if an athlete doesn't look forward to it, it, there's the cortisol can go up and you do have to, you know, there's a balance with it all. So bottom line, you know, I like using them in circuits as part of work capacity. I like using them to help efficiency. And like you said, yeah, there's good tendon health qualities to them. And so that's, that's my baseline package there. Um, just with the, and, and pretty much everyone gets that stuff. I'll also use them for recovery days. Like if an athlete is really beat up and I want to give them like a recovery day, I usually say, Hey, uh, we got extreme ice lunge, extreme push up, extreme dip, maybe high or low hang from a bar, maybe one other one, like a straight leg raise. And I just say, Hey, we're going to get three or four total minutes of this. Take breaks whenever you want, try to pull down into it. And usually they'll feel quite a bit better the next day. And so that's, that's another mode that I use that for. That was great. Yeah. Um, awesome stuff. Uh, kind of moving into a little bit of like the hamstring question, obviously a hamstring injuries, especially in, in football for us is, uh, you know, one of the most common prevalent injuries that we face And just all the different people that you brought on and, and heard, you know, some different, uh, perspectives from, um, what, what do you think is, is kind of the, some of the linchpins? I know that you haven't necessarily worked in team sport or the f- sport of football, but, um, what would you say are some of the linchpins in, in preventing, um, hamstrings and injuries? Yeah, that's a good question too. Cause I do have to take an intellectual leap to do, to work with something that I don't have that much experience in. Uh, I will say too, going back to, I did want to finish the isometric thing as I do like, 
I was going to say, I do like the Alex, the Alex Natera stuff. I, I mm-hmm. look forward to exploring a lot more in the coming years. I just haven't mm-hmm. had force plates or anything to kind of track that stuff. And I had been working mostly with aquatic athletes in my in-person work. And so I'm, I, I'm, I'll be, I'm transitioning here and I, I hope to get to more of that performance grade isometric. I just, I think Alex is onto something amazing and I am excited to do it myself. So I just wanted to well, add the two cents in with that. And I would just share, yeah, like uh, just some of the different, the unique uh, positions that Alex is utilizing the isometrics in, I think are, uh, are really good. I guess he kind of helped me to expand my box in terms of uh, other joints and whatnot, besides just like an isometric lunge or, um, you know, a, a rear foot elevated split squat hold and, and those types of things. And um, yeah, I think he's really got some good stuff. And I even like, you know, some of the, like the Franz Bosch hip lock stuff, I think is, you know, you're working, it's an isometric at the end range. And, you know, I think yeah, there's some benefit there, you know? So um, anyway, but good stuff. Yeah. Kind of moving on the, the hamstring question. Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> that's a, uh, yeah. So I'll just say what I, I'll tell you what I think, and I didn't have him on a podcast. He, his English isn't like phenomenal. Uh, it was a guy, it was at Paul Cater, who we both know, ran a hamstring, international hamstring project out in um, Salinas, California last year. And there was a guy who were, I don't remember what uh, football club he worked for, soccer football in Spain. But this guy, I mean, his his process was awesome. And one of the mm. things that I, I mean, they used a lot of like eccentric, like they had a, a flywheel leg curl. It's like a machine flywheel leg curl. And they do stuff on the versipulley where you're lying on your back and have the little wrap around your ankle and doing like kind of long leg and then short leg stuff. And so I thought that was cool. One of the things that he did that really stuck with me, because he was talking about how a lot of these soccer players would pull, it's like in a fatigue situation and it's an upright running. And so I, they were doing a, a cool drill that I saw where they were having them do various maybe like agility work on one side of the field that kind of fatigued them like in a game situation. And then they'd run across the field over some like low wickets to, uh, to work on not being overly backside and yeah. to have. And to me, it's more about the, the pelvic posture to me mm. is the, the biggest thing. But uh, to me, because there are some good athletes that have in, in track, you know, I'm not, a, I haven't looked at, <laughs> I haven't been an expert on case studies of here's when this guy pulled his hamstring and here's what he looked like running and, you know, da da da. But I will say that I think that that pre fatiguing and then running across the field to over the wickets and having that constraint. Uh, and then I think that is really good. Like that's game specific stuff. And so I think, I think that that type mm-hmm. of thing is because we talk about running mechanics and I, I guess just in my thought, it's like, well, what's good running mechanics? Is it knees up? You know, is it, it's, it's way more, is it, is it run tall and knees up? Well, not really. Like you're not gonna, you can't run like that in your sport. You have to have, I mean, unless the only way you can run tall is if you have and get away with it. Well, one, it's more of a track running mechanism, but two, you also, and I wrote about this in speed strength is those people who do run tall and have that good vertical force. You watch, uh, there's a great video of like Usain Bolt and like, you know, running in the side view. It's like Usain Bolt sprint mechanics. And you can see they're running, they have those, that higher total hip height, but that's made possible because if you watch in their track spikes, they're, they have more plantar flexion than the average person at ground contact. And they also have that supination and a foot steering that helps them up the chain to work with those taller hips. And so, mm. and the average difference between a track sprinter and a team sport is the team sport athlete is on average going to hit with a little bit more bent um, leg coming down because more likely than not, that's just the way that they run to mo- to be able to change directions really quickly. You know that I need to change directions at a moment's notice. And again, I do think there could be some diversity in how you run. But so perhaps these drills that we have, I, I just I think those some of these drills only work if there's also other pieces that are in the equation that also fit um that's so that's kind of like i do think running drills mostly should just fit around posture and pelvic alternation that's i think that's the biggest thing and just not being stuck in anterior and stuck in a certain way uh outside of that i think if you can add those elements that are more game like like fatigue and then you know running over wickets or maybe running with a you could say like that med ball in front or something that could facilitate that running under fatigue i think that could be really helpful and yeah, I, I and also I like I I believe in Nordic hamstrings, and I think you could debate that stuff. But I I'm a believer in that stuff. I think that's good. The eccentric stuff I mm-hmm. think is good. Um, 
So just that and then running with good pelvic alternation under fatigue, I think is uh, where, where I would go with the most solid things. I really, yeah, I love what you shared about the uh, wicket with fatigue state. I, I find just we had utilized some wicket drill stuff and um, a lot of our guys had never, ever, I think, felt proper position, you know what I mean, or just what it was like to be – uh, where they needed to be, you know, or, and it was, uh, I, f- I found it pretty helpful, but, uh, um, that's good stuff, I guess, kind of shifting to more of like a, uh, a programming, um, macro cycle type view of, of things. And I love, you know, I think there are a lot of correlations between track and football and just the diversity of athletes that we have to work with. And, um, you know, I think one of the things, looking at general programming versus specific programming. And, um, you know, there's just so many different directions. I think we can go with this question, but I think, you know, some of the things that I'm chewing on, I'd love to just get your feedback on, on kind of how you solve some of these problems is, is, uh, yeah. What is the, the general and position specific work? Like in our sport tip in a typical off season, our guys would be, um, you know, we, we don't really have that much time with them to do, um, non-football specific work like um, you know we're obviously sending programs home with them in the March in the months of January February March April hits we have a short brief window where they're with strength and conditioning and then and they're out on the field with their position coaches uh, you know for the next let's say six seven weeks um, then there's a, a slight break and they come back for training camp um, so I guess I'm just kind of curious like um what that kind of looks like from a a macro cycle. Like I know um, you have athletes, uh, elite athletes that uh, running is, you know, their sport and their sports skill. And they take an entire month off of running uh, every year, you know, and, and, you know, are, are those types of things um, how you kind of look at it or how you see that, that yearly cycle. And, and obviously if you start into things too fast, then you have nowhere to go. Right. If you, um, you know, don't have sort of like, um, uh, some good variation and, and, and places to take the athletes. So I, I'm kind of leaving with a, a pretty broad stroke here, but just kind of, uh, curious to get your feedback on, um, looking at those things and how maybe you would cycle in different methods throughout the year. Um, I know the max strength question is a big question, you know, how much time do you devote to that? And, um, when throughout that macro cycle, do you, you find that that would maybe fit in or, um, and kind of, kind of go from there? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, yeah. So you mentioned max strength. I think that'd be a good place to start with. I think that, you know, we've had this conversation before athletes who have to feel like there's athletes who probably could really not touch heavy weights and maybe more in the skill, but, and probably be okay with it. Like not necessarily you know, just to want to play. And then there's guys that want to hit a certain weight to feel good. Like there's that confidence and I don't know, maybe that's more, they're more of a grinder. Maybe they're not. Um, I know. I mean, well, actually I'll, I'll ask you like, what's your, what's your um, experience with that? Like what's the general vibe in terms of this, the bandwidth of your players who really want to feel those heavy weights and those, and who don't, what's your bandwidth there? No, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think, you know, we have the, those guys that fit into that camp where it's, you know, just such a big part of who they are and, and, what has given them some confidence into being, you know, the NFL caliber athlete that they are. Um, and they want to hit those weights, you know, and they want to feel strong and they, and then I think there's other guys that, you know, are kind of, you know, you're still convincing them that, that it's important for them just from a resilience standpoint, not necessarily to hit some max effort rep, but just that, you know, I think for me, it's like, you know, Hey, it's about balance. Right. And, with the strength work for me comes into, um, you know, we're doing all the speed and plyometric and, you know, we kind of need the yin and yang of that. And that's where some of the heavier loading, slow loading, um, you know, to me provides some of that for, for the tissue and the body um, just from a resilient standpoint. And not that they need to be hitting one RMs, but that they need to be doing enough strength work to kind of, provide that balance to their body and, and, uh, and the system as a whole. So, uh, but yeah, I, I do think it's kind of across the spectrum spectrum, but then I, I think that there's kind of an obligation on our end as the coach, um, to help them understand, uh, 
just how taxing some of that work is and how some of that can be actually pulling away from what they're trying to accomplish on the field and with the skill work. And as much as psychologically they want to hit that, you know, that's part of our obligation as coaches is to help educate them and help them to understand and convince them why, um, you know, maybe some focusing on some of this other work is actually more in your best interest. And in some cases you'll find that the athletes, you know, that, that really resonates with them and not that they're relieved that they don't have to hit the weight. I mean, but in some ways I think it gives them a little bit like, Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, maybe hitting, you know, a single at 550 or whatever is, is pretty good. You know, I don't have to hit 650 or seven or whatever crazy, you know, they had in their, their past, um, so I don't know. I think it, you're, it's all across the spectrum, you know, and I think that's obviously the, the beauty of coaching is it's trying to help each athlete kind of come to their, their own, uh, self-realization on, w- on what they need and what's best for them. Yeah. I, I, I like that. And that, that kind of makes me think about, again, I don't, I've, the athletes I work with are generally not, you know, no one's squatting 500 pounds in my camp. Um, but I do think about even within the bandwidth of just to say working with swimmers, I don't feel like any of my swimmers for the most, except for maybe some 50 free guys really need to hit any particular lift in the weight room to be as good as they can mm-hmm. be there. Needs, there's really no number for the most part. I mean, unless, I mean, at least the people I work with are pretty, they are just, they're gifted and they're usually pretty strong naturally or through some work. And not to say that there's not some transfer in like getting better at a pull up and some various lifts and things like that. There is, it's good, but there's no, an athlete's been with me and they're on the pro level for six years. Mm -hmm. No lift one RM is going to make the difference at that point. It's all their sports skill at that point. I just need to facilitate the optimal thing that goes around it. So I always think about, I also think about like Milan Yovanovich's, um, like just talking about, you don't want to create any unnecessary peaks. (laughs) So I just, and like you said, educating the athlete in terms of, look, like, like if you do this, that's, but here's what it's going to potentially cost you in this, in, in a sense. Um, yeah, like you said, just, try, or I also, my mind almost goes to always trying to, trying to reframe people too. Like, it's like, okay, if you want to lift this, well, if we throw a tendo on it and here's your, this is what your estimated about max would be. If you want to feel like where you're at, let's like, let's just trying to reframe stuff. Um, so my, I guess I would say, you know, for the most part, and, and I, I'll, I'll, frame this around how I periodize I work with elite and established athletes who have hit a strength standard for the most part is Mm -hmm. I just the biggest thing is I just try to keep them interested and make a training program that's meaningful and creates novelty and helps them to feel uh, also I like what do you want to feel in here like what makes you feel good in here like let's try Mm -hmm. to get that without necessarily taking anything away from the water and I think maybe that's from a strength component for established that's that's been a big one if if there's it's revolves around like a big lift um, other than that, I've definitely gotten a lot more into like all the functionally stuff. I do way more, um, like you talked about the ISOs, like I'll do like, like tons of like ISO, um, handstands for swimmers and, and tons of monkey bar and pull up combos and stuff that just really integrates, uh, being a human more. And so I try to pull that out to make more of a challenge if I feel like you know, oh, they want a big challenge. Okay, well, here's one, you know, hold a handstand for three minutes. <laughs> I, I'd rather have you do that than uh, from a functional perspective, this being for a swimmer, than to hit a particular weight in a lift that you're already pretty decent at. Mm-hmm. So reframing reframing some things that I, I and not trying to create unnecessary peaks are two things that kind of come to mind in that um, yeah. realm. And then I do think, I don't know, I feel like there's always a time too where athletes do well with that i always notice athletes do really well a lot of them not all but like with a month or two of autonomy sometimes like where they get a little more say and because i got i get athletes who just want to be a meathead for mm. a few months and cool like if i was doing too much i would take away your experience and so i want you to do your thing you know i i, I want i want you to have experience that creativity on your own i love that man i yeah wade gilbert um he was at Fresno state, but he does a lot on kind of coaches, coaches, and he used a word autonomy within bounds. And, uh, that's always stuck with me. And I'm just a big believer in providing as much autonomy as you can with, with maybe some boundaries around it. Um, and just always feel like that's a powerful tool for the athletes, but that's good. Um, do you, do you generally, I mean, how much break from like the specific sports skill do you think, um, athletes, 
like my world, you know, it's kind of like, all right, well, how long? And it, and a lot of it's dependent on age of the athlete and everything's unique and, and whatnot, but how long should an athlete go before they, you know, get back and start running and moving again after the off season and, and those types of things. Um, based on your experience, just with track and field, uh, what have you t- seen as s- some typical healthy breaks? Uh, for me, it was always how long can you go before you can't stand it anymore. However, that only works for someone who's like a like is going to work themselves really hard, <laughs> you know, or like versus a player who perhaps might you know would be if we just let everyone go might be inclined to not do as much and show up without having done. So I, you know, <laughs> what was that? Uh, sorry, I, the audio. Oh, I was just joking. I was- yeah, if we let them go on their own, they would uh, take six months off. Sorry for the delay. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, it's. I think it's just, yeah, I was just a person. I, I got so much um, just enjoyment and validation, I guess, on some personal level about from, from doing those things. So it's. I'm not the norm. So for me, it would be, I would just, I would go till I couldn't stand it, which was usually two or three weeks, and then I'd start doing something. Uh, I think that one thing, uh, I think for the perfect world yeah take a month off like for track like just i think a lot of people are afraid to take like time complete just this being my experience in in individual sports is i find coaches are often very afraid to take time completely off but i think that stuff is important to let all the receptors reset all your neurochemistry reset everything reset because it's a long season man like whatever whatever your sport is i mean i've seen people who for track were 400 runners and the season's in you know, April, May, June, and it's July and they're running 600s on the track. I'm like, where are you going to go from here? Like, you're going to be so bored of this in like four months. Like your, your dopamine response is going to be so diminished by the time you get there. And so I'll I'll say, I don't know how on topic this is, but one thing I really liked is, you know, in Cal, uh, he's at Missouri now, uh, Nicodemus Christopher, he's a basketball strength coach. And something he did between in transitions was, and I think other people I've seen do this a little bit is he would have his guys go play all the sports, like get like they, I think he would like get the other coaches involved. Like they, the basketball guys would go play tennis for a week and then they go play soccer for a week and just to do everything else. And, and kind of to, you, you lose that you're a, a basketball player for a while. And I think that's good. Like, I think it's good once a month, a year, or at least to kind of lose the identity of what you think you were and just enjoy playing and being a kid. And I think that almost might be the most important reset of all in some ways. And so I just like, I like doing that as much as I can. Like I'm a big games person naturally, but yeah, I think that's important. That's great. Um, so I'm, I actually got to get going, um, Jules. So I'm going to, that was most of the questions I had. So that was, that was pretty good good just uh yeah one more on some some of the complex work that you do but no it was good man it was well well thank you for interviewing me i, I appreciate you you're uh, you're off to a very fine interviewing career josh i, I appreciate oh. you uh, you going through this with me no I, I was uh i mean it was a lot of fun like i said i normally i would just call you the phone and pepper you with all these questions <laughs> but uh i was cool we could uh, just record it and then now hopefully somebody else gets something out of it as well so thanks for tuning in for that show it was really fun being interviewed by josh and again just totally humbled i to have someone of his caliber asking me questions so uh, we will see you guys next week with another guest uh, in the meantime if you enjoyed the show definitely don't hesitate to leave us a rating or review on itunes stitcher whatever you're listening to we would totally appreciate that also want to give a shout out to our sponsor, simplyfaster.com, suppliers of high-end training technology, awesome training blog. Their store is second to none in terms of the scope and breadth of the high-end training technology, data collection, training tools that you'll find there. So be sure to support them and check them out. And we'll see you guys next week.